Section 7 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 1. Notes to Hans Fall. Note 1, referencing the title. Strictly speaking, there is but little similarity between the above sketchy trifle and the celebrated moon story of Mr. Locke, but as both have the character of hoaxes, although one is in a tone of banter, the other of downright earnest, and as both hoaxes are on the same subject, the moon, moreover, as both attempt to give plausibility by scientific detail, the author of Hans Fall thinks it necessary to say, in self-defense, that his own jeu d'esprit was published in the Southern Literary Messenger about three weeks before the commencement of Mr. L's in the New York Sun. Fancying a likeness which, perhaps, does not exist, some of the New York papers copied Hans Fall and collated it with the moon hoax, by way of detecting the writer of the one in the writer of the other. As many more persons were actually gulled by the moon hoax than would be willing to acknowledge the fact, it may here afford some little amusement to show why no one should have been deceived, to point out those particulars of the story which should have been sufficient to establish its real character. Indeed, however rich the imagination displayed in this ingenious fiction, it wanted much of the force which might have been given it by a more scrupulous attention to facts and to general analogy. That the public were misled, even for an instant, merely proves the gross ignorance which is so generally prevalent upon subjects of an astronomical nature. The moon's distance from the earth is, in round numbers, 240,000 miles. If we desire to ascertain how near, apparently, a lens would bring the satellite, or any distant object, we, of course, have but to divide the distance by the magnifying, or, more strictly, by the space-penetrating power of the glass. Mr. L. makes his lens to have a power of 42,000 times. By this, divide 240,000, the moon's real distance, and we have five miles and five-sevenths, as the apparent distance. No animal at all could be seen so far, much less the minute points particularized in the story. Mr. L. speaks about Sir John Herschel's perceiving flowers, the papaverias, etc., and even detecting the color and shape of the eyes of small birds. Shortly before, too, he has himself observed that the lens could not render perceptible objects of less than 18 inches in diameter. But even this, as I have said, is giving the glass by far too great power. It may be observed, in passing, that this prodigious glass is said to have been molded at the glass house of Messrs. Hartley and Grant in Dumbarton. But Messrs. H. and G.'s establishment had ceased operations for many years previous to the publication of the hoax. On page 13, pamphlet edition, speaking of a hairy veil over the eyes of a species of bison, the author says, quote, It immediately occurred to the acute mind of Dr. Herschel that this was a providential contrivance to protect the eyes of the animal from the great extremes of light and darkness to which all the inhabitants of our side of the moon are periodically subjected, end quote but this cannot be thought a very acute observation of the doctors. The inhabitants of our side of the moon have, evidently, no darkness at all, so there can be nothing of the extremes mentioned. In the absence of the sun, they have a light from the earth equal to that of thirteen full unclouded moons. The topography throughout, even when professing to accord with Blunt's lunar chart, is entirely at variance with that or any other lunar chart, and even grossly at variance with itself. The points of the compass, too, are in inextricable confusion, the writer appearing to be ignorant that, on a lunar map, these are not in accordance with terrestrial points, the east being to the left, etc. Deceived, perhaps, by the vague titles, Mare Nubium, Mare Tranquilliatis, Mare Fecundiatis, etc., given to the dark spots by former astronomers, Mr. L. has entered into details regarding oceans and other large bodies of water in the moon, whereas there is no astronomical point more positively ascertained than that no such bodies exist there. In examining the boundary between light and darkness, in the crescent or gibbous moon, 
where this boundary crosses any of the dark places, the line of division is found to be rough and jagged, but were these dark places liquid, it would evidently be even. The description of the wings of the man-bat on page 21 is but a literal copy of Peter Wilkins' account of the wings of his flying islanders. This simple fact should have induced suspicion, at least, it might be thought. On page 23 we have the following, quote, what a prodigious influence must our thirteen times larger globe have exercised upon this satellite when an embryo in the womb of time, the passive subject of chemical affinity, end quote. This is very fine, but it should be observed that no astronomer would have made such a remark, especially to any journal of science. For the earth, in the sense intended, is not only thirteen, but forty-nine times larger than the moon. A similar objection applies to the whole of the concluding pages, where, by way of introduction to some discoveries in Saturn, the philosophical correspondent enters into a minute schoolboy account of that planet, this to the Edinburgh Journal of Science. But there is one point in particular which should have betrayed the fiction. Let us imagine the power actually possessed of seeing animals upon the moon's surface, what would first arrest the attention of an observer from the earth? Certainly neither their size, shape, nor any other such peculiarity, so soon as their remarkable situation. They would appear to be walking, with heels up and head down, in the manner of flies on a ceiling. The real observer would have uttered an instant ejaculation of surprise, however prepared by previous knowledge, at the singularity of their position, the fictitious observer has not even mentioned the subject, but speaks of seeing the entire bodies of such creatures, when it is demonstrable that he would have seen only the diameter of their heads. It might as well be remarked, in conclusion, that the size, and particularly the powers of the man-bats, for example, their ability to fly in so rare an atmosphere, if indeed the moon have any, with most of the other fancies in regard to animal and vegetable existence, are at variance generally with all analogical reasoning on these themes, and that analogy here will often amount to conclusive demonstration. It is perhaps scarcely necessary to add that all the suggestions attributed to Brewster and Herschel in the beginning of the article about, quote, a transfusion of artificial light through the focal object of vision, End quote, etc., etc., belong to that species of figurative writing which comes, most properly, under the denomination of rigmarole. There is a real and very definite limit to optical discovery among the stars, a limit whose nature need only be stated to be understood. If, indeed, the casting of large lenses were all that is required, man's ingenuity would ultimately prove equal to the task, and we might have them of any size demanded. But, unhappily, in proportion to the increase of size in the lens, and consequently of space-penetrating power, is the diminution of light from the object, by diffusion of its rays. And for this evil there is no remedy within human ability. For an object is seen by means of that light alone which proceeds from itself, whether direct or reflected. Thus the only artificial light which could avail Mr. Locke would be some artificial light which he should be able to throw, not upon the focal object of vision, but upon the real object to be viewed, to wit, upon the moon. It has been easily calculated that, when the light proceeding from a star becomes so diffused as to be as weak as the natural light proceeding from the whole of the stars, in a clear and moonless night, then the star is no longer visible for any practical purpose. The Earl of Ross's telescope, lately constructed in England, has a speculum with a reflecting surface of 4,071 square inches, the Herschel telescope having one of only 1,811. The metal of the Earl of Ross's is six feet in diameter, it is five and a half inches thick at the edges and five at the center. The weight is three tons. The focal length is fifty feet. I have lately read a singular and somewhat ingenious little book, whose title page runs thus. L'homme dans la lune ou le voyage chimérique fait au monde de la lune. 
nouvellement découvert par Dominique Gonzalez, aventurier espagnol, autrement dit le courrier volant, mis en notre langue par JBDA Paris, chez François Pio, près la fontaine de Saint-Benoît, et chez J. Guagnard, au premier pilier de la grande salle du palais, proche les consultations. 1647. The writer professes to have translated his work from the English of one Mr. Davison, Davidson, although there is a terrible ambiguity in the statement. J'en ai eu, says he, l'original de Monsieur Davison, médecin des mieux versés qui soit aujourd'hui dans la connaissance des belles lettres et surtout de la philosophie naturelle. Je lui ai cette obligation entre les autres de m'avoir non seulement mis en main ce livre en anglois, mais encore le manuscrit de sieur Thomas Danan, gentilhomme écossois, recommandable pour sa vertu, sur la version duquel j'avoue que j'ai tiré le plan de la mienne. After some irrelevant adventures, much in the manner of Gil Blas, and which occupy the first thirty pages, the author relates that, being ill during a sea voyage, The crew abandoned him, together with a negro servant, on the island of St. Helena. To increase the chances of obtaining food, the two separate and live as far apart as possible. This brings about a training of birds to serve the purpose of carrier pigeons between them. By and by, these are taught to carry parcels of some weight, and this weight is gradually increased. At length, the idea is entertained of uniting the force of a great number of the birds, with a view to raising the author himself. A machine is contrived for the purpose, and we have a minute description of it, which is materially helped out by a steel engraving. Here we perceive the Senor Gonzales, with point ruffles and a huge periwig, seated astride something which resembles very closely a broomstick, and borne aloft by a multitude of wild swans, gansas, which had strings reaching from their tails to the machine. The main event detailed in the Seigneur's narrative depends upon a very important fact of which the reader is kept in ignorance until near the end of the book. The Gansas, with whom he has become so familiar, are not really denizens of St. Helena, but of the moon. Thence it had been their custom, time out of mind, to migrate annually to some portion of the earth. In proper season, of course, they would return home and the author, happening, one day, to require their services for a short voyage, is unexpectedly carried straight up, and in a very brief period arrives at the satellite. Here he finds, among other odd things, that the people enjoy extreme happiness, that they have no law, that they die without pain, that they are from ten to thirty feet in height, that they live five thousand years, that they have an emperor called Irdonazur, and that they can jump sixty feet high when, being out of the gravitating influence, they can fly about with fans. I cannot forbear giving a specimen of the general philosophy of the volume. Quote, I must not forget here that the stars appeared only on that side of the globe turned toward the moon, and that the closer they were to it, the larger they seemed. I have also me in the earth. As to the stars, Since there was no night where I was, they always had the same appearance, not brilliant as usual, but pale, and very nearly like the moon of a morning. But few of them were visible, and these ten times larger, as well as I could judge, than they seemed to the inhabitants of the earth. The moon, which wanted two days of being full, was of a terrible bigness." I must not forget here that the stars appeared only on that side of the globe turned toward the moon, and that the closer they were to it, the larger they seemed. I have also to inform you that, whether it was calm weather or stormy, I found myself always immediately between the moon and the earth. I was convinced of this for two reasons, because my birds always flew in a straight line, and because whenever we attempted to rest, we were carried insensibly around the globe of the earth. For I admit the opinion of Copernicus, who maintains that it never ceases to revolve from the east to the west, not upon the poles of the equinoctial, commonly called the poles of the world, but upon those of the zodiac, a question of which I propose to speak more at length hereafter, when I shall have leisure to refresh my memory in regard to the astrology which I learned at Salamanca when young, and have since forgotten. End quote. 
Notwithstanding the blunders italicized, the book is not without some claim to attention, as affording a native specimen of the current astronomical notions of the time. One of these assumed that the gravitating power extended but a short distance from the Earth's surface, and accordingly we find our voyager carried insensibly around the globe, etc. There have been other voyages to the moon, but none of higher merit than the one just mentioned. That of Bergiac is utterly meaningless. In the third volume of the American Quarterly Review will be found quite an elaborate criticism upon a certain journey of the kind in question, a criticism in which it is difficult to say whether the critic most exposes the stupidity of the book or his own absurd ignorance of astronomy. I forget the title of the work, but the means of the voyage were more deplorably ill-conceived than are even the ganzas of our friend the Señor González. The adventurer in digging the earth happens to discover a peculiar metal for which the moon has a strong attraction, and straightway constructs of it a box, which, when cast loose from its terrestrial fastenings, flies with him forthwith to the satellite. The flight of Thomas O'Rourke is a jeu d'esprit not altogether contemptible, and has been translated into German. Thomas, the hero, was in fact the gamekeeper of an Irish peer, whose eccentricities gave rise to the tale. The flight is made on an eagle's back from Hungry Hill, a lofty mountain at the end of Bantry Bay. In these various brochures the aim is always satirical, the theme being a description of Lunarian customs as compared with ours. In none is there any effort at plausibility in the details of the voyage itself. The writers seem, in each instance, to be utterly uninformed in respect to astronomy. In Hans Fall the design is original, inasmuch as regards an attempt at verisimilitude, in the application of scientific principles, so far as the whimsical nature of the subject would permit, to the actual passage between the earth and the moon. End of note one. Note two, referencing, quote, It appeared to me evidently in the nature of a rare atmosphere extending from the sun outward, beyond the orbit of Venus at least, and I believed indefinitely farther. End quote. The zodiacal light is probably what the ancients called Trabis. Emicant Trabis quos docos vocant. Pliny, Book 2, page 26. End of note 2. Note 3. Referencing, quote, It has been observed that, in balloon ascensions to any considerable height, besides the pain attending respiration, great uneasiness is experienced about the head and body, often accompanied with bleeding at the nose and other symptoms of an alarming kind, and growing more and more inconvenient in proportion to the altitude attained. End quote. Since the original publication of Hans Fall, I find that Mr. Green, of Nassau Balloon Notoriety, and other late aeronauts, deny the assertions of Humboldt in this respect, and speak of a decreasing inconvenience, precisely in accordance with the theory here urged in a mere spirit of banter. End of Note 3 Note 4 Referencing, quote, my ideas on this topic had also received confirmation by a passage in the 82nd volume of the Philosophical Translations, in which it is stated that at an occultation of Jupiter's satellites, the third disappeared after having been about one minute or two minutes of time indistinct, and the fourth became indiscernible near the limb. End quote. Havelius writes that he has several times found, in skies perfectly clear, when even stars of the sixth and seventh magnitude were conspicuous, that, at the same altitude of the moon, at the same elongation from the earth, and with one and the same excellent telescope, the moon and its maculae did not appear equally lucid at all times. From the circumstances of the observation, it is evident that the cause of this phenomenon is not either in our air, in the tube, in the moon, or in the eye of the spectator, but must be looked for in something, an atmosphere, existing about the moon. End of Notes to Hans Fall